That was a blessing. Thank you, ladies and children. We're going to turn our attention back to Romans chapter 13 this morning. I'm actually going to stop in a text in Ephesians and I want to say a special again a thank you. I want to praise the Lord. For, uh, thank you for all those ladies in the labor yesterday, labor of love and the ladies' tea. And I, I know all who came, it was a special blessing. And uh, a lot of work went into that, and it's, it's, it's a joy. Uh, we're thankful for talented ladies, and, and uh, it's something we, uh, we desire to, to do on a, a, maybe a little bit more regular basis. So uh, all you, uh, you talented ladies, that's uh, one of your... Uh, it's a nice thing is that different people take charge, ownership, if you will, of an event like that and, and run it. And so we're uh, hoping to do more like that uh, throughout the year. So just uh, get your creative juices running, all right? And uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to fellowship together, also introduce others to the body of Christ. And I know we had a number of guests, and I'm thankful for that as well. Uh, as it being Mother's Day, one of the things that uh, doesn't happen often, I don't usually, uh, do, do, don't, I, I don't, tremendous stock, just to be honest, and a lot of the, uh, you know, there's a lot of professional athletes who parade around their belief in God, and, uh, you know, you just, I have no, I, I mean, some of them you get a little better feel for than others, I, you just don't know, I mean, I hope it's real, I do, uh, but uh, this past week, uh, one professional athlete uh, in his MVP speech, just Kevin Durant, but the only, what I'm pointing to is, I mean, there's two things, one, he praised God, which I'm thankful for, and two, he gave a fitting tribute to his mother and her investment in his life, and, and that really stated, and I thought it was well said, that she is the true MVP, and so I, I wanted to say a special thank you to mothers this morning uh, for putting up with all of us children who are not always grateful or thankful, <laughs> and uh, so... Uh, I'm, I stand in both sides, having been a child, not grateful and thankful, having raised children that weren't always grateful and thankful to their mother for all she does. Uh, but it, it is one of the things we ought to pray for, and I hope you are praying for, as the Lord would move in our land, uh, to bring true revival that would restore the dignity of motherhood. You can't live in an, abo an abortion culture and maintain the dignity of motherhood. You just can't. And it's being systematically destroyed in our society, and it's, it's sad. Um, and, and the model of, of femininity, femininity that is being portrayed to our culture is, is one that is not very in line, I would put it that way, in many ways with the scriptures. And so it's one of those areas that needs to be combated rightly, uh, and, and really modeled, and I thank God for godly mothers, ladies in our church, and families, that's a blessing. Uh, text that I thought about preaching from would be one of my favorite ones in terms of marriage, and I uh, uh, just, it's a great text because it's, it's so instructive of God's love for us. It also brings to this reality that one of the reasons God created marriage the way it's he defines marriage, and I've said this many times, God defines what a marriage is, not a culture, okay? A culture can decide things that are legal, but doesn't make them right, okay? Because something's legal doesn't mean it's right, okay? All right, it just doesn't, all right? So God defines marriage, and, and he's created marriage. He's created marriage with this wonderful portrait and, and this wonderful teaching tool. Also, we all need models. We all need examples, and, you know, for guys here, I, I've, I've done this before, you know, Mother's Day, let's preach to the men. Because, <laughs> you know, what higher example can you get than to love your wife like Christ loves his church? I, I, you know, if anybody's putting up your hand and say, okay, that's me, uh, you know, we're all in trouble right there, all right? We're, we're just, there's so far to go. But the, it is a tremendous uh, setting forth. But there's also such great encouragement in this text about who the head of the church is and how much he loves his people. Because he loves his people more than any, any husband loves his bride. More than any husband ever has, ever will, love his bride and sacrifice for his bride, Christ loves his people. That's a tremendous encouragement, folks. He nourishes it. And so I'll just read the text real quick. But wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and it's himself its savior. And now as the church submits to Christ, also wives should submit to, every, uh, to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. 
And know what Christ does for the church. He sanctifies her. He cleanses her by the washing of the water with the word. So he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh. But nourishes and cherishes just as Christ does the church. And, and he drives that home. Christ nourishes and cherishes his church. That's a wonderful truth and a great encouraging reality. And as we're called on men, we're called on to love like Christ loves his church. Uh, that's a st high standard, but the news, uh, while it can be overwhelming at times to think how far I fall short, the good news is, is that God not only has called me to love this way, he's poured out his love into our hearts so that we can actually love this way. Now, because I'm still a sinner in flesh, I'm going to fail fail miserably at loving it that way consistently. But the good news is, because of God's love poured out on our heart, we can love like this. That's good news. That's good news for your marriage. That's good news for your relationship. We can love this way. And, and we can love this way, and as the church then follows after Christ, then we, wives, you can follow after a husband. Even as a church follows after Christ, we can live this way. And uh, how does this all this connect to our text in Romans? Well, I think the connecting point, too, is in this section as we end Romans 13, Paul draws together his instruction on love. And last week we looked at this divine obligation uh, that if, if we're being transformed by the power of God as worshipers, then we are to love as we are loved. We are to love one another as we are being loved by God. And that really was verses 8 through 10 we looked at last week. Obviously that connects. Men were to love like Christ. Well, ultimately... All of us here stand under this divine obligation of love. It's a debt we can never repay. It is the glue of all relationships. It is, what, it is to drive every relationship that we have is to be geared and followed after through love. Because I, I, no matter what someone has done to you, you owe them a debt of love. You just can't get around it because we did nothing to receive the love that God gave us, that unconditional love John talked about this morning that was poured out upon us, that voluntary, God loved you voluntarily, not compulsion. It wasn't earned, it wasn't merited. He made you an object of his love. As those who've received the love of God, you are then to be a conduit of that love to others. And so there's a great connecting point there. And then in this text, we're uh, in, in our second section, and we're going to look at the second obligation this morning. But this verse, being a key verse in this section, says, let us walk properly as in daytime. And he goes on all the things that are not proper, right? He lists these kind of activities that are not proper, not fitting. I, I don't think any of us have any problem understanding these things should not be named among the children of God. This should not. These are violations of love. Uh, if we live in any of these things, we're not loving. Okay, so he calls on us to walk properly as in daytime. Walk is obviously a, a common analogy of Paul of living out the life. That, that and one of the things about a walk is it's, is it's progressive. It may not be dynamic. You may not be getting very far very fast. Okay, you know, I don't know how fast some of you walk. Okay, your walk is progressive though. If we are walking, we are headed towards something somewhere. The walk of the Christian life is taking us progressively towards Christ. There is a progression in the Christian life. There is movement that is moving towards Christ. Paul says, let us walk. Let, let the transforming grace of God be evident in your life so that you live properly. And I, I love Barclay's suggestion here. He says, let us walk in the loveliness of life. That the Christian life lived out in following Christ is a beautiful life, folks. It is a gorgeous thing. As a text this morning we read on marriage, when marriage is functioning as a portrait of Christ's love for the church and the church is uh, following after Christ, marriage is a beautiful thing. It's an incredibly beautiful portrait of, of how sinners can be joined together into a one flesh, a one relationship where, where we are so joined that our joys are together, our heartaches are together, all our life is spent together. And that, that marriage is a, an amazingly beautiful thing when lived the way God intended it to be lived, right? 
When it's followed after in biblical principles, marriage is gorgeous. That's one of our, you know, one of the realities for all of us and, and, and is that your marriage relationships should be a portrait of Christ. And it should be compelling to the world that they ought to want marriages like that. You know, our country kind of is, is still in that quasi state of where we're not really sure if that, that's fairy tale stuff. Is that just stuff put to us in Cinderella? You know, is that just the, 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 the prince come along and the happily ever after? We like stories like that, but I don't know if we're fully convinced that marriages like that can exist anymore. If you read some of the things that are being written by popular psychologists and sociologists and their recommendations and, and they're saying things like we've moved past marriage that we've come to this new reckoning in our culture and these are the things they're writing that we really don't, you know, we, we just have relationships for a season. And they're just, it's really naive to think any one person could ever be the right person for you. Okay, this is where we're going as a culture, this kind of stuff that's being portrayed to people. But it's, it's the nonsense of a world that lives in orgies and drunkenness and immorality and sensuality. It's the nonsense that flows out of a culture that's in rebellion against God. But you know what every little girl longs for? Prince Charming. Every little girl longs for that day when the man who would love her unconditionally would be brought into her life. Why? God made her that way. We are to walk in the loveliness of life. Our marriages are to be a portrait of the beauty of God's grace, our lives. Folks, Christianity in America is, is not in a great healthy state because there's so much that has been taught to us in our culture to be more and more like our culture. More, we, We've so emphasized Christian freedoms to the place where people want to be as, as, you know, I want to be as close to sin as I possibly can. In fact, I probably really want to live there, but just don't tell me. Tell me it's okay. And we, we've lost sight that holiness is beautiful. Holiness is beautiful. A life set apart from sin and devoted to Christ is a beautiful life. It is the light then that will shine into the darkness of this world. It is so let men see. Let them see by your good works, by a life, a beautiful life of devotion to Christ. Let them see that. James puts it this way in James 3. He asks the question, who is wise and understanding? And he, he, his answer comes back, let them show it by their good life. Let them show it by a life that is really, truly good, that is good defined by God. Let them show it in deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. That there is a great humility about the Christian life because we recognize that we're simply needy sinners that reflect a great God and that the life we live is to be a reflection of his grace. There's to be loveliness. There is true beauty in the Christian life when it's walked in genuine fellowship with the Lord. And so one of the ways we ought to pray as we look at Romans uh, chapter 13 and end this section and look at 11 to 14 this morning I just ask you this throughout this week and as you study this text some more yourself to ask the Lord to help us live in such a way that our lives portray the beauty of the gospel. That it is evident that God's transforming power, the power of his grace is on display. That we have new life in Christ and we want it to be evident that people can see the good work that God has done and is doing in our life, and that will open further doors for us to speak of our amazing God who loves sinners over which we should be dumbfounded and stand in amazement and praise that God would love sinners like us. Not only would he love us, but he would call us to be his children, adopt us into his family, pour out his love upon us, 
and give us the amazing privilege of taking that gospel that changes lives just like it did yours to others. Folks, there's great joy in knowing Christ, isn't there? Man, our faces don't always display it. You know, we don't always come into the church. We don't always come in and display the joy of the Lord. We don't always make it evident by our countenance. I mean, we're all dealing with the fact we live in a fallen world filled with difficulties and filled with sufferings and hurts and all that go into living in a fallen world. But folks, this text comes at us from a... There's two ways you come at the admonition, if I can put it this way, of living the Christian life. One of those perspectives, and really Romans 12, 1 and 2, came at it from this way. In light of what God has done in your life in saving you, now live. Because really Romans 12, 1 and 2 pick up from Romans 1 through 11, and he lays out the whole doctrine of salvation, justification on the basis of faith. That you and I can't be justified by works, that we're sinners, our works cannot justify us before God. So if you're here today and you come from a religious tradition that's taught you that you do certain good works and you're going to earn God's favor, and by doing those works one day you're going to gain heaven, I would just tell you, just, just read the book of Romans, it stands against that kind of thinking. That the book of Romans just confronts us with this reality that we're sinners who violated the glory of God and stand condemned by God, and we need a great Savior. Good news, Christ is a great Savior. And Jesus Christ paid the debt you could never pay, and he calls you to turn from that self-reliance or that system of works that you've bought into where you're going to offer to God something in exchange for a future, and he says you have nothing to offer to God, and you have nothing to complain about because God has revealed himself, and God has loved you, and he's called you to come out of sin to himself, and when you come there, you enter into this whole new relationship that's rooted in grace. You're delivered from a realm of sin and death, and you're brought into a new realm of grace and life. Salvation's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. I was dead in trespasses and sin, and God made me alive in Christ and brought me into a whole new life now characterized by ongoing display and provision of grace that continues to change my life and make me more like Christ. And Paul really at Romans 12 comes at it and says, now listen, this is what God's done in your life. Therefore, in light of the mercies of God, what God has done in saving you, now present your body a living sacrifice. Now worship in this way. Now here at the end of Romans 13, he kind of turns the perspective. And he advances us out here, and he says, you know what God has, is going to do? In fact, I'll just go ahead and jump here. You know, verse 11 begins this. He says, this you know the time. You know what time it is. You know, as he says here, that salvation is near, that we first believe. The night is gone. The day is at hand. He goes to the future, and he says, you know what day is about to dawn? In light of what God is about to do, now live this way. You see how this perspective shifts. But at both ways, he's hemming us in. I can come at it from the look. This is what God has done in your life. Now you're to respond with true worship. This is what God is promised to do, this work that he's going to consummate, he's going to bring to a finish in light of what God is going to finish in the day that is about to dawn. Now live this way. And so he advances the perspective and he comes at it from that future angle and presses in on our life. And, and, and he comes at it and he draws us into this reality and, and he wants us to live. Let me read the text and we'll, we'll, we'll walk through just three points this morning. The children of God reveal the transforming power of God by living as light in a dark world. Okay, the children of God, if you have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, you've experienced the love of God and salvation, if that's your testimony this morning, then your life is to be a revelation or display of the transforming power of God. How do I do that? You live as a light. You live as one whose life has been set apart from the darkness. And that light-darkness analogy, I think, is pretty common and fairly simple to understand. You are now in the light. Jesus Christ is the true light. You've been set apart from darkness, sin, from the realm of sin and death. You've been brought into the realm of light, into grace and life. Now live as a child of that light. Reflect that light. 
So Romans 13, verses 11 to 14 says, and you get, you get the put off, put on analogies. I mean, he's tying into language, just like in Romans 12 would say, present your bodies this way, stop being conformed to the world, be transformed. That language, now he kind of shifts the language to wake up, wake up, cast aside the darkness or the old works, stop being conformed to this world, put on, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, put on the armor of light. So besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from the sleep for, the sal for salvation is nearer to us now than we first believe. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. So the first thing, as you see, is, is to live as a light, or living as light, or I could rephrase it, in light of living out the loveliness of life, that new life in Christ, if we're going to display that new life in Christ, then we must remain alert to the dangers of living in a fallen world. That's why he says, wake up. Any of you ever uh, set your alarm and slept through it? Have you thought you set your alarm? That's always the worst one, right? You think you set your alarm, you think you double check. In fact, you set two alarms because you might. And, and for whatever reason, it didn't go off. Later, the phone goes off. And the first question that person asks you is, do you know what time it is? And when that question usually gets asked, do you know what time it is? Usually, my response is, uh, uh, you know, something sinking in your stomach because you immediately know, uh-oh, I'm late to something I was supposed to be at. There's something happening today is important and I am missing it because usually when somebody asks, do you know what time it is? I know, I know parents ask that too of kids, like you come home late. Do you know what time it is? Um, you know, we, we, that question, so it rings in my head when I look at this text and he says, this you know, the time. You know the time, you know the hour and it's come for you to be awake and not be asleep. And so he, he comes at this and he points to us at, at this time that we know. And I like that phrase, this you know. Well, what do we know? I don't know how often you just stop and say, okay, what do I know? It's part of preaching the gospel to ourselves. What do I know to be true? You know, when life comes at you with double barrel of trouble and it happens, how do you respond? Do you respond just by the overwhelm, by the circumstance, the difficulty, the hurt? Or do you begin to go back through the truth you know? This we know. What do we know? We know we live in a world that's passing away. We know this isn't our home. Aren't you glad? <laughs> Aren't you glad you got something better than this? I, I, I mean, th th this world's passing away. And in this world, there are far more people who love darkness than there are people who love or live in light. We know that this is a day in which Satan is deceiving the masses of humanity to live in rebellion against God while promising them that following his rebellion will bring them happiness. And I don't think it's working out so well for them. But people believe that lie and they follow it and lives are being systematically destroyed by that lie from Satan. We know that this is a day <clears throat> when God's people are going to be hated and are going to suffer for living a life of righteousness. We know this is a day that we've been called on to redeem for the Lord, which means to buy up every opportunity to speak for Christ. We know that this is a day to be good soldiers of our King, to engage in spiritual warfare so as to advance his gospel against the kingdoms of darkness. We know that this is a day when the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. The defensive structure of the city collapses. As the church advances the gospel, we have nothing to fear. We know that this is our time. This is our hour that we've been given to make disciples of all nations, to proclaim the coming of our God and King. Paul tells us to wake from our slumber so that we might not be unfruitful or unproductive as we serve Christ our King. If we are going to live as light in this dark world, then we must not blend with the darkness. It is time to wake from our sleep 
to reject being absorbed by the world around us, by this age and its standard, but to stand against the works of darkness that are being celebrated in our society. How many times you've been driving somewhere and you've, you've maybe pulled that all night drip or that over too many hours or you didn't get enough sleep and you got to that place where you know you're doing one of these? Now I'm not gonna ask you if you pulled over and stopped. But you, you, you know that it was like, okay, I shouldn't be doing this right now. I, I shouldn't be, I'm not really alert. I, we, yeah, I, I, I don't, you know, how many commercials do you see or have you seen uh, of the person who the last thing they did was text something to somebody right before they died? Okay, has that stopped you from texting? Don't raise your hands. You know, what is it gonna take to stop us? Well, just that one right accident, right? The one that you're in. You know, we, we, we often are not, we, we hear the warning, right? There's, my whole point is we, we know the warnings and there's a lot of things we know that are dangerous, but we don't necessarily stop, which usually means that I lack a little wisdom or a whole lot of it. And I think somehow I'll be the exception I'm the one that's gonna make it. That's not gonna to happen to me. And here the Lord just comes and really opens up a warning. He says, don't go to sleep. Don't be asleep in the world that you live in is hostile to truth. Don't expect it to be your friend. Don't expect the world to what it pleasures in and what it markets to you and what it holds up in front of you and says, here, you need this to be happy. Here, you gotta have this experience. Here, you need this. Don't expect the world to tell you the truth. Don't go to sleep at the wheel. You know what kind of world you live in. Now, you know what you've been called to do. And, and we can, and I can be guilty of this, and I don't know if, I mean, you know, look at the difficulty of the day we live in and look at how much our culture is capitulated in all kinds of ways, and, and you get a little discouraged and think, well, what's the use? Folks, you gotta remember who you serve. This is, this is the day for God's people to engage with the gospel with absolute confidence that our God is in a saving business. He brings life to that which is dead. We don't live in a hopeless culture. Your neighbor is not lost, hopelessly lost. Your loved one is not hopelessly lost. The gospel is God's power to salvation and we've been called to take that gospel to the ends of the earth. Know what day it is. It's time to wake from our slumber and engage in, in, in the works of righteousness to advance the gospel, or as Paul would say in, in Ephesians chapter five, and I think I put this text, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, tying in with our whole theme, get wisdom. Well, what does wisdom do? It makes the best use of the time. Why, days are, you know what day it is? Don't be surprised by the evil is this world gonna wax worse and worse? Are men gonna advance in their sin? Yes, that's what the Bible tells me, right? So I know the day, but I also know how I'm supposed to live because I know the future. So I don't get despondent in an evil day. I wanna buy up the time in this day and use it for Christ. So we live as light by remaining alert. We live as light by, and our, our, I should say, our, our living as light is infueled. I mean, it's motivated, it's compelled. It grows in intensity as your anticipation for this day increases. Well, why should my anticipation of the day of Christ increase? Because in that day, the battle against sin will be over. Folks, if that's not good news, then we don't recognize how much we struggle with sin still. I mean, we all struggle, we're still sinners. We buy into wrong value systems, it happens. We chase after wrong things, we look for pleasure where it isn't really found and, and we do destruction relationally with one another because we don't get governed by love. There's a lot of things that happen in this sin-cursed world that brings, the, that part of it is, I live in a sin-cursed world, there's going to be hurt as a part of it. And because I'm still a sinner, I participate and make it worse. But here's the good news. The day is coming when this battle against sin will be over. 
And so he says, you, you know, the hour, awake, there's be, be alert, but now he says salvation is nearer than when you first believe. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. Folks, the night is far gone. What is he talking about? The day in which you and I lived, in which sin is trumpeted from the, street, the housetops, where the world celebrates it, where the devil seems, and I put it that way, seems to be having free course in the society, and people are following after all this deception, and sin is ramped up this day this night is almost over. This night is almost past. This time when evil is trumpeted and celebrate is soon going to close. It's almost done. In fact, he says the day is at hand. And in the, the Greek, the, the, the vocabulary there, or the tenses of the verbs there that he uses, he uses a perfect tense, which basically means that this is a settled condition. It happened the day, and really from the onset of Christ's ministry, his earthly ministry, Jesus came, he's lived this life of righteousness. He gave himself on the cross of Calvary. He died and rose again in victory over death and sin. He has inaugurated or commenced the last days. We live in latter days. We live in the day where the next major event on God's prophetic calendar is the return of his son. The king is coming again. And he will destroy in righteousness and he will set a kingdom of righteousness on this earth. And that kingdom will ultimately be forever and God's children are going to dwell in his presence forever in a kingdom in which sin will no more dwell, will never have a part. Folks, that's the day that is at hand. It is a settled state. He doesn't say we know that's going to happen in our lifetime or we know it's going to be tomorrow or the next week or whatever the next date setter sets out a date. He doesn't say that. He simply says, you know this, the nighttime in which you now live is almost over. And the day of Christ's return is at hand. It is an any moment event. It is that which is right before us and it is to be lived with great anticipation. But you know, where I struggle with that is the more I love life in this world, and life in this world is a good gift, folks. I love my family. I, you know, if Lord tarries, I hope to see, you know, one of my children married. I hope to see my children married. I, I look forward to the day I get to play with my grandkids, that kind of thing. Those are things I look forward to. Not wrong to look forward to those things. Not at all. But you know what? If that treasure, and it is a treasure, right? Life's a treasure. To enjoy my family, grandchildren, all that kind of stuff would be a treasure I would look forward to. Love the opportunity to walk my daughter down an aisle someday and be her as her dad. I mean, those are things, treasures, that I pray that I would get that opportunity. But here's the thing. As much as I treasure this, there's something I should treasure more. You see, the, the, in the day of darkness in which I live, the Savior whom I love is mistreated more than he's honored. He's belittled more than he's championed. I, I mean, I don't just think about it in this way. I, I, don't, I don't usually respond well to somebody who belittles my child. Why? Well, I love my kids. But I live in a day in which my Savior is belittled more than he's honored. Or I should say, put it this way, I live in a night. Because a day is about to approach when he will never be dishonored again. I live in a nighttime where I often find my pleasure in something other than my Savior. And it's not that I shouldn't find pleasure in those other good gifts, but I find more pleasure, take more pleasure in them than I do in my relationship with Christ. That day is soon to be over. The greatest gift ever given to me, the greatest gift anyone can ever receive is new life in Christ. It is to belong to Christ, to know Christ, to love Christ, to have that relationship with Christ that isn't just temporary. The love of God is eternal, everlasting love. I've been clothed with everlasting love. And the reality is as soon I will see my, Savior's face to, my fa Savior face to face, and then I will know pleasure forevermore. Then I will never again treasure the wrong thing then my body will never again get sick. Then I will never again face death, death 
myself, death of a love, death will be gone. The last enemy is death. It will be destroyed. Christ had victory over death. That day is coming. The day is at hand. Folks, if we believe, if this is just where, I, I mean, I have to keep repeating. What do I know? What do I know? I know Jesus is coming. And I know he's going to settle a kingdom of righteousness in which sin is going to be wiped out and destroyed. I know he's going to give me a new body that will never again grow old or get sick or die. I know that in his presence is fullness of joy and pleasures evermore. I know that. Do you know that? I mean, you know, anybody who's raised kids in, in this culture knows that, you know, somewhere around the, this summer, you'll, you'll set a Christmas list out. You know, maybe you wait till fall. I don't know when you do it in your family, but somewhere along the line, you set a Christmas list out. Your kids write the, all the things that they want to get for Christmas. And then they begin, and, and they begin building up anticipation to that day when they just can't wait. They can't sleep the night before, and they, uh, they want to, uh, I got to get to the present. We know what anticipation is. Or for maybe, maybe a better analogy, because we just went through graduation season, and you know, you work hard and study and you do all that, and there's a, uh, there's a commencement service where that degree is finally awarded, where all that labor and sacrifice is then recognized, and there is, there's a commencement, there's a celebration, and it's much anticipated and should be. And, and ladies all anticipate, you know, through nine months of pregnancy, uh, by the time they get down near the end, there's a real anticipation to to have the baby and not be pregnant anymore, right? So all that goes into it. We understand anticipation. Anticipation's a powerful thing, isn't it? And Paul just draws into this and says, look, you know what time it is, and you know the day is at hand. Your salvation is nearer now than when you first believed. Isn't that a great truth? The work that God began in the day that he called me out of the darkness of sin and he made me an object of his love and granted me faith and repentance, you know, there was a new birth that happened in that day. And ever since that day, God has constantly clothed me with his grace, granted me grace, clothed me in his righteousness, and through that grace has been tra- transforming my life. I don't know. So, okay, it stopped ringing. Somebody say hello. All right. It was not the Lord calling, I promise. He doesn't need a telephone. <laughs> All right. The trumpet. Boy, that'd be a good day, though, wouldn't it? Some of you, one of you ought to, that's what you ought to program on. Everybody ought to program that in your cell phone. All right. A trumpet. And then we should just systematically have a flash trumpet in the middle of service. <laughs> and everybody close your eyes and then look and see who's left. No. The, the day is at hand, and, and that, that's calling for something. It's calling for a response. He's telling us, look, this battle against sin is almost over. James tells us in James uh, chapter 5 in two different spots, in James 5 and verse 7 and 8, he tells us, be patient. Why? The Lord's coming is near. Be patient. Stand firm. Stand your ground. Don't bow under it or go back to the Romans language. Don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed or the Romans 13 text. You know, wake up. Don't be slumbering. The day is at hand. It's right near. And he's saying in the midst of the difficulties of living in a fallen world, grace is greater than that. You can endure. You can hang on. You can make it to the end. There is something far greater coming. What you've suffered yet is nothing in light of what you're about to experience. Keep the now in perspective of what is certain. The day is at hand. The author of Hebrews would put it this way in in chapter 12. He would say, consider him. Speaking of Jesus. In chapter 12 says, you know, fixing your eyes, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. In verse 3, he says, consider him. Consider Christ. Consider what he suffered. You know what Jesus taught us? That dying is better than sinning. Didn't he? He could have called 10,000 angels. 
But to have called 10,000 angels and not went to a cross would have been to sin against his father. He could have stepped down from that cross. He didn't have to put up with the mockery of the trial. He didn't even have to let him arrest him. Just read, I mean, when we read through our, the, the, the Gospels, you find times where people wanted to drive him off a cliff. They wanted to do this or that. He just walked right out. He didn't have to endure that, but to not endure it would have been to sin. It would have been not to do his father's will. You go back in Hebrews chapter 10, it goes again and again. He came to do his father's will because his father's will was not ever satisfied through the Old Testament law and that sacrificial system. There had to be one perfectly righteous that would give his life for sin, and that would be God's own son. He came to do God's will, but then it gets better. He didn't just come to do God's will. He called, came to call sinners like you and I out of sin so we too might do God's will. Go back to Romans 12, 1 and 2. Renewing our minds, transforming our lives so we would know what is that good and perfect will of God. He came to make us doers of the will of God. So he says, the night, is, the, the, the night is far gone. The day is at hand. You can live with great anticipation that the struggle against sin is almost over. The author of Hebrews in chapter 12 says, look, in your struggle against sin, you haven't come to the place of the shedding of your own blood. I think that's fairly self-evident. You haven't yet died in your fight against sin, right? Okay, we haven't yet died. And he's saying in your struggle against sin, which is also reminding us that, hey, from now until the Lord comes, you and I are gonna struggle against it. But it's a good fight of faith. And we have been given the equipment to fight that battle. And the final thing is just, if we're going to live as light, um, well, I, sorry, I'll just go ahead and jump here. If we're going to live as light, then we have to be active participants in the war against sin and in the pursuit of Christ's likeness. And that's where he goes. He says, so now cast off. And he, he takes that language, the language of clothing, language of being in a, in fil- having filthy garments, and he says, cast them off. Fling them aside. Here's that responsible participation. It's all a part of spiritual growth or sanctification that you and I are to live in light of our few, live in light of what God has already done, live in light of what God has promised to consummate and bring to completion, and that your struggle against sin is almost over. The day is coming when it will be over and you will know fullness of joy. You're to live in light of that and be a light in this dark world. And now he says, now we must fight against sin and in pursuit of Christ's likeness. And so he he tells us, cast off the works of darkness, those things associated with, because remember, before you were saved, you were in the realm of, help me out, before salvation, all of us are in the realm of what? Light or darkness? Darkness. In fact, the Bible would say you were in the kingdom of darkness, who is under the power of the prince of the power of the air. It's this kingdom ruled not by individuals like people think, well, I'll just do what I want to do. It's not really true. They're simply following another leader. The prince of the power of darkness is Satan himself that's just believing a lie that rebellion against God can ever bring happiness. It can't. All right, so we were all a part of that system of darkness. Through salvation, we were redeemed from darkness and made a citizen of a kingdom of light. We were brought into the realm of light. And so he says, now here's the responsibility. We've got to cast something off. We've got to recognize that when I, before I was saved, I lived in this world of darkness. There's things I believed and did and practiced that really are associated with the darkness, not the light. You know, I, I once worked in that sewer, so to speak. I worked and lived in it, and, I, and my life was stained by it. And now it's time to cast off those garments that have been stained by sin or the darkness of the world, and I am to put on a whole nother set of garments. In fact, actually not even garments. Now he uses the word for weapons. 
And it is the weapons of light. It's plural, so it's most tied often to the armor. Paul uses armor as a common analogy. Uh, the Christian is to put on the armor of God. But he really just says the weapons that are associated with light, we have been clothed in, in righteousness of Christ. Now we are to live in that realm with these weapons of righteousness. And so we're responsible to remove the old attitudes and actions that were associated with the darkness. And if I can just uh, say this, uh, if this morning, if you've never come to Christ in saving faith, then dear friend, I just want to tell you that you live in darkness, not light. And the only pathway into the light is through the one who is true light himself, Jesus Christ. The good news is he's full of grace and truth. He'll never lie to you, he'll never deceive you, and he's full of grace and mercy. So he calls on you to turn from sin and the darkness and come to the light, and he will welcome you there. And you would become then an object of his love and no longer an object of his, his wrath, his just wrath against sin. The day is coming when God will destroy the darkness. The evil day is coming to a close. And so if you are still in darkness, then you need to come to the light which is Christ himself. And he tells us, and we already looked at verse 13, but he lists some of these works of darknesses, and he, and he just walks through them, and he gives them in pairs, set up in two, and they have inner relationship to one another, and, and he's just dealing with the nature of the culture they lived in, which obviously, there's a lot of parallels, folks. I mean, the whole, the first one, the, 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 you know, so he deals with orgies and drunkenness. I mean, it's just revelry. It's, it's, it's righteous living. It is, uh, it is party lifestyle. One, one commentator said it, it's basically, uh, all he's saying is they, they went from fe feast to feast to feast with all these drunkenness, which led to great immorality in, in, in the culture we live in today. I think I mentioned this a few weeks ago in college campuses across America. One in four girls are date raped. The number one weapon used to accomplish it is alcohol. That's the culture we live in. So you want to go to the college party life and you want to run that party lifestyle, that's what is exactly happening in American culture today. Okay, in Rome, they did it in pagan temple to pagan temple. But they went from pagan temple and feast and activities that led to all kinds of debauchery and, and immorality, and that was being celebrated as freedom and liberty. We've got that kind of language being talked about today and sexual liberation and freedom and, and all we can, we, we've come so far as a culture. No, we haven't. We've regressed. We've become more and more pagan in our view of sexual, human sexuality and the practice thereof, and it's leading to systematic destruction of our culture. And so that's all associated with the darkness. You, if you're part of the light, are to have nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. In fact, he goes on with that and, and drunkenness. And one of the things, and this is, again, I, I could give you, I, I should, and I probably need to do this in the future, just go on to, to deal with one of the things that surprises me at, at the fact that we live in a day in evangelical Christianity in America where there is a ravenous defense of social drinking where everybody is defending that you have a right to drink and you can't say drinking's wrong, blah, 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 blah. Folks, drunkenness is a part of the darkness. You want to play the games of social drinking, just remember this. You don't really know where that line of drunkenness is. God does. You cross the line, you're in darkness. And you and I have been called never to be a stumbling block to others either, which we could go off of. We'll really get to that next, Romans 13, 14, or 14, 15, dealing weak or stronger. There's so much. You know, alcohol rightly used medicinally. After that, you know, after that, I honestly, I, I do not see any reason for anyone to be a quote-unquote social drinker. I, I don't see it biblically. I don't see it. I, I think you're playing with darkness in which you have professed to have been delivered and you should get out of the darkness. Cast it away. Sexual immorality and sensuality, he really just goes to the, the term used for the marriage bed, which Hebrews 13 tells us to be honorable. That'd be a nice reversal of our culture, wouldn't it? That we really believe that sex belonged inside marriage only, period, end of story. 
The average Christian doesn't believe that in America anymore, which means we've believed the darkness rather than the light. I mean, the Bible is really, really clear here, folks. It's not confusing. It's very straightforward. Sexual immorality does not belong among the people of God. It doesn't belong. It's part of darkness. Pornography, all of that's associated with it, the sensuality, the, the gross perversion of beauty, all of that, what our culture calls beauty, all of that is a part of darkness. And we have to fight against that to recapture the beauty of holiness. Folks, you and I are supposed to live a lovely life, a life that displays the holiness of God set apart from sin. In all of our relationships, so he goes on and really in the next, the last two, he, he, he just dwells in and he goes singularly because now he comes, those were plurals, he comes singularly and he just, he addresses our attitude and actions to just get into the fact that we just want to quarrel and fight because we want to be right. And that's what he's focusing on and that becomes a very important conversation as he comes into chapters 14 and 15 dealing with weaker and stronger brethren who are fighting over who's right. And so he's saying, remember that that kind of attitude is associated with darkness, not with light. And then he closes it off in, it, it, with this admonition to put on Christ. And uh, here's this text about weapons, because we're to have the weapons of light, put on the weapons of light. This same word is used there in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. That we are fighting a warfare, but the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly, but they have divine power to destroying of strongholds and destroying arguments and lofty opinions raised against the knowledge of God and taking every thought captive to obey Christ. That's the kind of weapons you've been given. You've been given divinely powerful weapons. See, folks, you and I, the, the good news, the gospel is good news. I, I mean, I can't say that enough. The gospel is good news. Why? Because God didn't just give you heaven. He delivered you from the power of darkness. He delivered you from the power of sin. There is no sin stronger than grace. There's no sin greater than the power of God to deliver you from it. You and I are not victims. We're victors. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world filled with sin. We, we don't have to live in sin. We're going to still be sinners because we're sinners. We're still going to sin. I know that. We're going to struggle, but in our struggle, we are to continue that fight and we are to engage with a battle mindset that every day, you, you know, I mean, I look around here and no one charged out of your home this morning in the same thing you slept in last night. I don't think. I may be mistaken. Maybe some of you get dressed at night on, on Saturday night and say, this is going to make my quick morning departure here. Boom, jump up and run out the door. But most of you, know, most of you didn't do that. You know, we, 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 we get dressed for the day, whatever that day. Now, I, I mean, I've got, my wife can tell you, I've had to systematically throw them away, but I have, I have clothes that really weren't supposed to be paint clothes, but I made them paint clothes. You know, I've got work clothes now that really were nice, and I would find, you find yourself, you know, sometimes the car breaks down and you're trying to do something, you end up and you just ruin something really nice. Sometimes you go down to, to something and you didn't anticipate what was going to end up happening, and, and then for me, I'm just too lazy to go back to the house and change, so I, I won't get it on. Oh, I guess those are going to be work pants now or a work shirt now. You know, we've been inappropriately dressed for the occasion and ruined more than a few things. All right, now, every day, the Lord is just saying to you and I, remember, you need to get up in the morning prepared for a battle. So that's not good news. I don't like to fight. He's not talking about fighting with people around you. He's telling you that your battle is against principalities and powers in high places. But remember this, you have divine weaponry. You're not a victim. You are called out to take the weapons of righteousness and fight a glorious battle against the darkness knowing that it cannot prevail. It can't prevail. The weapons of righteousness, the weapons of our warfare are greater than the devil's weapons of sin and the culture's deception. You march out in the world into the midst of a warfare, but know this, you are clothed with weapons that cannot be defeated by the powers of darkness. Now charge. Folks, it's time to charge, isn't it? It's time to wake from our slumber. 
and live like we really believe that our God is greater than the power of sin, that our God is better than sin, that our pleasure in serving him is greater than the pleasure the world finds in its sin. Folks, the world loves its sin, doesn't it? And you can't watch, just watch. They market it, they tell you, they put it in television shows, they advertise it, they celebrate it, they put it all over the place. They love their sin. And they want it to look as attractive as they can make it look. You know, the beer commercial doesn't show you the guy who's been an alcoholic and spent all of his money and, and doesn't take care of his family. They don't show you that guy. They show you the people who are having fun and they're so fun. The world markets its sin and it wants you to believe the lie that sin will bring you pleasure. It's time for the people of God to reclaim the reality that our pleasure is found in our God and he is greater than the pleasures of sin. You fight the battle against sin with an eager anticipation of the coming day when this battle against sin will be over and the pleasures of righteousness will be forever. Folks, we serve a great God and the gospel you claim to believe is the gospel set you free from the power of sin. Aren't you glad? God has called us to live as citizens of light. God has called us to march into the darkness of this world and be a light in a dark place, knowing that our king is coming. And when we see him, it will be worth it all. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his glorious face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let's pray.